to start learning category theory, you see, okay, uh, category theory unifies lots of things. I mean, if you, if you abstract enough, right, if you chop up all the unnecessary stuff and you are, you know, on top of Mount Everest and you, you are looking down, uh, then suddenly these, all these things start looking similar, okay? Like from that high level, you know, all these programming, little programming languages look, look like, you know, little ants and they behave the same way and it's like, okay, they're all the same. At that level of abstraction, all this, all this programming stuff, uh, it's, it's, it's all the same. It looks the same. But that's not all. <laughs> Suddenly at this high, high level, other things look the same. And, and then people, mathematicians discovered this. Uh, they've been developing separate areas of mathematics, right? So first of all, they, they um, develop geometry, algebra, uh, number theory, topology, um, what have you, right? Set theory. These are all completely different, separate theories. They look nothing like each other, right? And category theory found out similarities between all these things. So it turns out that at a certain level of abstraction, the structure of all these theories is the same. Right? So you can describe, you, you know, you tweak with the structure of a category and you, you suddenly get uh, topology. You tweak this, the structure of category, right? And you suddenly get set theory. You tweak something else, you know, and, and, yeah, and you get algebra. Okay, so there is this unification, this grand unification of essentially all areas of mathematics in category theory, right? But then there is also programming, right? Programming that's, that deals with these computers, with these uh, memory and uh, processor registers, okay? And this stuff can be described also, and the, they're the programming languages. This, this stuff can be described mathematically as lambda calculus, like all these languages that they essentially have roots in lambda calculus. They, they try to get away from bits and bytes and go-tos and jumps, right, and loops, and they want to uh, abstract this stuff into, into stuff that's, that's more like lambda calculus, right? And there are these data structures, and these data structures, you know, we used to look at them like, here's a bunch of bytes, here's a bunch of bytes, here's a pointer from this bunch of bytes to this bunch of bytes, and so on, right? It's like very, very low level, like the plumbers working with, with tubes, right? And then um, um, computer scientists say, uh, well, okay, actually these things, they form types. Okay, so there's type theory. There's type theory that can describe all these categories of data structures, right? And, uh, but there's also type theory uh, in mathematics, right? People invented types in, in math not to solve problems that uh, computer scientists have. They try to solve problems like paradoxes. Like there is uh, uh, Russell's paradox, okay? That says if you want to, uh, you, you cannot construct a set of all sets, okay? Things like this. Or maybe you know this, this barber's paradox, whether the barber can shave himself or not, you know, every barber shaves only people uh, who don't shave themselves, so can he shave himself or not, right? <laughs> this kind of paradox, I mean, these are funny paradoxes, right? But, <laughs> uh, but they're, they are serious. So this, this barber's paradox actually can be translated into Russell's paradox, which is like the, the set of all sets, or can a set contain a set that, you know, like sets that don't contain themselves, 
don't form a set, and so on. Stuff like this, right? And, and Russell came up with this theory of types that to, to like uh, say that sets form layers upon layers that you cannot just, you know, have all sets and put them in one big set, right? And then the type theory evolved from this and there is this uh, very abstract Martin Love type theory, uh, very formal, right? Uh, so that's, that's just a branch of mathematics that was created to deal with paradoxes. And then there is logic, and logic was created, you know, long, long time ago by the ancient Greeks, right? They used logic. So there, there are lots of logic, and people have been studying logic for thousands of years, right? And at some point, people suddenly realized that all these distinct areas of mathematics <coughs> are exactly the same. This is called the curry howard Lambeck isomorphism, which says that whatever you do in logic, right, can be directly translated into whatever you do in type theory. That they have actually exactly, it's not like they are similar, they are exactly the same. There is the one-to-one -one correspondence, right? And the Lambeck part of, of this isomorphism says that um, category theory, there are certain types of categories, you know, the, the Cartesian uh, compl complete categories, that, that, they, that they are actually totally describe the same thing. So it's like there are these three different theories. One is about computing. Right? One is about categories, another is about types, and they are all the same. So like all, essentially all our human activity is described by one theory. Okay? So this is like really mind-blowing. And of course, mathematicians, you know, when they discover things like this, they, they, they turn philosophical or I, I wouldn't say religious, but at least philosophical, right? It's like, oh my God, we are discovering stuff. It's like, you're not really creating mathematics, right? You're discovering some deep, deep truth about the universe, okay? Like, what do you think, I mean, Is mathematics something that we invent? Or is it like built into the universe? Because physicists, this is no, right? Physicists do experiments. So, like, we study stuff that, you know, we, we throw these atoms at each other, bang, bang, right? And, and we observe something. So we are discovering stuff that's around us, right? Whereas mathematicians, no, they just sit down at the desk, right? With a pencil or, or walk around in a park and think, right? What are they discovering? And now they are saying, well, we have independently discovered this branch of mathematics. This guy discovered this branch. This other guy in ancient Greece, he discovered logic, right? This guy in Sweden discovered type theory, you know? And they discovered this, the same thing. There is some really, really deep truth in it that we are discovering. So it's like, there is some platonic idea Right? And I was thinking about it, and I thought, no, this is, this is really not... There has to be a, a simpler explanation, okay? We come head to head with a very complex problem, like how to provide food for our tribe, right? And we solve it. How do we solve it? We divide it into smaller problems that we can solve. And then we combine the solutions, okay? So this is the only way we know how to deal with complex situations, by decomposing in, decomposing these things into simpler things, and then solving them at 
the simplest problems and combining the solutions into uh, bigger solutions. And this is everywhere, okay? You find this, this is so permeates everything we do that we don't even notice it, okay? But this is how we work. And because this is how we work, this is how we do science as well. So every branch of science, every branch of mathematics is, we can only see these things that can be chopped into pieces and then put together. So no wonder they look the same, okay? Because we can only see these problems that have the structure. If they don't have the structure, we just don't see them. We just, like, say we cannot solve this problem, okay? Let's, let's do something else. Maybe we can get grant for solving that other problem because that seems choppable into smaller pieces. This one doesn't. Let's forget about it. Let's not even talk about it, right? <clears throat> so, one could think, okay, so maybe, maybe the whole universe is like this. Maybe everything in this universe can be chopped into little pieces and then put together, right? Maybe that's like the property of this universe and our brains are just reflecting this, okay? And uh, personally, I don't think so. Maybe I'm wrong, and maybe, uh, hopefully I'm wrong, but I'm a physicist also. I mean, I started as a physicist, right? So, so I, I saw what, what was happening in physics. And in physics, we, we also wanted to chop things into little pieces, right? Like, and it, we were very successful at this, you know, like, uh, we, we found out that matter is built from atoms, right? So atoms are these, these things that we, we can separate and can study, right, their properties and then say, okay, the, the property of a, of a rock or a piece of metal comes by combining the properties of these atoms. So we can, we can decompose a piece of rock into atoms, study them and then recompose it, right, and, uh, and then we, we have the understanding of that. How, how this is, uh, but but then we didn't stop at that because we wanted to see you know, what's inside the atom, right? Uh, so there are these elementary particles, there are these electrons, protons, and so on. Uh, so at some level, I mean, if if we want to be decomposing things into simpler things, these simpler things have to have simpler properties. For instance, what's the simplest? thing that we can imagine for an elementary particle, it has to be a point, right? It should be a point. I mean, if it's a ball, right, then maybe we can cut it, chop it into smaller pieces and, uh, and then do the decomposition, recomposition, and so on. So at some level, some lowest possible level, we cannot chop it anymore and, and we should find a point, right? So a, a, an elementary particle should be a point. Um, that would be like the end of, of, of this level of, of de decomposition, right? And we tried doing this, right? And then we have like the, the standard model of, of, uh, of particles in which we assume that particles are points. We sort of cheat because it turns out that we cannot really deal theoretically with point particles because they lead to infinities, like two point particles when they get very, very, very close together, right? The interaction goes to infinity and everything blows up. So we came up with this renormalization theory, which is like a big hack, you know, to get rid of infinities and so on. And, uh, and of course, physicists were not very happy with that. Uh, so they thought, uh, okay, so maybe at this lowest level things are not as choppable as we thought. Maybe nature really does not follow this kind of, you know, divide and then combine. So they came up with this, with this idea that maybe elementary particles are strings, right? Have you heard of string theory, <laughs> right? 
like, what a crazy theory this is. That this most elementary thing is not a point, but it actually is a string, and you cannot chop it, right? It's like the elementary thing is, is not divisible, but it's not a point. And quantum theory now says uh, this is another uh, non choppable piece of knowledge that we found out. It says, okay, so if you have uh, you know, a, a bigger system, right, that maybe you can separate it into elementary particles and you can say, okay, I have a system of 10 particles, I know properties of these 10 particles. Right, and, and I call this system something bigger, like an object, right? And, uh, and I can find out the structure of this object by looking at, at, this, at these particles. And it turns out in quantum mechanics that a state that, con that, is, that, will, that they don't add up, okay? A state that has two particles is not a sum or a product or a convolution of states of, of single particle. It's a new state, which follows a different, you know, differential equation, and so on. So we try to separate particles, in, you know, and suddenly we cut the particles apart, and, and it turns out that, you know, something weird happens in between when, when you are cutting. Right? You are actually m changing the system by separating things, okay? So maybe, maybe at the very bottom, the, or maybe there is no bottom, or maybe at the very bottom things are not um, separable, maybe things are not composable. Maybe this composability that we love so much, that, that is not a property of nature. That's what I'm saying. Maybe it's not a property of nature. Maybe this is just the property of our brains. Maybe our brains are such that we have to see structure everywhere. And if we can't find the structure, we just give up. So in this way, category theory is not really about mathematics or physics. Category theory is about our minds, how our brains work. So it's more of epistemology than ontology. Epistemology is how we can uh, reason about stuff, how we can learn about stuff. Ontology is about what things are, right? Maybe we cannot learn what things are, but we can learn about how we can study them. And that's what category theory tells us. When I started programming, uh, I started programming in assembly language. Like the lowest possible level, right? Where you actually uh, tell the computer exactly what to do, right? Down to grab this thing from memory, put it in the register, use it as an address, and then jump, and so on. So. This is very precisely telling the computer what to do, right? This is, this is a very imperative way of programming. We start with this most imperative approach to programming and that sort of, uh, we drag this, this approach to programming uh, throughout our lives, right? And like we have to unlearn at some point. Uh, <clears throat> and this approach to programming sort of, uh, in computer science is uh, related to Turing machines. A Turing machine is, is this kind of very primitive uh, machine that just stamps stuff on, on a paper tape, right? There's no high level programming there. It's just like, this is the assembly language. Read this number, put it back on tape, erase something from the tape, and so on. So this is this one approach towards programming. By the way, all these approaches to programming were invented before there were even uh, computers, right? 
And then th there's the other approach to programming that came from mathematics, the lambda calculus, right? Uh, Alonzo Church and these guys. Um, that was like, what is, what is possible to compute, right? Thinking about um, mathematics in terms of how things can be actually executed uh, in some way, transforming things, right? <coughs> uh, so, so these approaches to programming are not very practical. Although people write programs in assembly language, and it's possible, but they don't really scale, right? So this is why we came up with languages that offer higher levels of abstraction. Right? And so the next level of abstraction was, was uh, procedural programming. And what's, what's characteristic of procedural programming is that you divide uh, a big problem into procedures. And each procedure kind of has its name, has a certain number of arguments, Maybe it, it returns a value sometimes, right? Not necessarily, maybe it's just for side effect and so on. But uh, it, it, because you, you, you chop up your work into smaller pieces, and, and you, you can like, deal with bigger problems, right? So this, this kind of abstracting of things uh, really helped in, uh, in programming, right? And, and then next, uh, people started, uh, came up with this idea of uh, uh, object-oriented program, right? And that's even more abstract, because now you have stuff that you are hiding inside objects, and then you can compose these objects, right? And uh, once, you, once you program an object, you don't have to look inside the object. You, you can kind of can forget about the implementation, Right, and, um, and and just look at the surface of the object, which is the interface, and then you can combine these objects without looking inside, and, and you know you have the bigger picture, and then you combine them into bigger objects, and, and so you you can see that there is a a certain uh, idea there, right? Um, it's a, it's a very important idea that if you want to deal with more complex problems, you have to be able to chop the bigger problem into smaller problems, right? Solve them separately, and then combine the solutions together, right? And that there is a name for this. This is called composability, right? So composability is something that really helps us in programming. What else helps us in programming? Abstraction. Abstraction, that, that comes from, from a Greek word that means more or less the same as subtraction, right? Uh, which means getting rid of details. Like you want to hide details. You don't want to, you, you want to say, uh, these things, they differ in some small details, but for me they are the same. I don't care about the details. So an object is, in object-oriented programming is something that hides the details, abstracts over some details, right? And there are even these abstract data types that just expose the interface and you are not supposed to know how they are implemented, right? So, uh, so when I first learned object-oriented programming, I thought this is like the best thing since sliced bread. And I was a big proponent of, of object-oriented programming. And, uh, and uh, together with this idea of abstracting things and, and, uh, um, and composing things comes the idea of reusability, right? So if I have these blocks that I have chopped up and implemented, right, maybe I can rearrange them in different ways. So once I implemented something, maybe I will use it in another pro problem uh, to solve another problem. I will have these building blocks. I will have lots of building blocks that hide their complexity, and I will just uh, juggle them and, and put them in new constellations, right? So it seemed to me 
like this is really the promise of object-oriented programming. I'm buying it. And I started programming uh, in an object-oriented way using C++, and I, I became pretty good at C++. I think, you know, I wrote a lot of C++ code. Um, well, it turns out that there is something wrong with this uh, object-oriented approach, and it became m m more and more painfully obvious when uh, uh, people started writing concurrent code and uh, parallel code. Okay, so concurrency um, does not mix very well with object-oriented programming. Why doesn't it? Because um, objects hide implementation and they hide exactly the wrong thing, which makes them not composable. Okay, they hide two things that are very important. They hide mutation, they mutate some state inside, right? And we don't know about it. They hide it. They don't say, I'm, a, I'm mutating something. And sharing, they use pointers, right? They share data. And they often share data between each other, you know, between themselves, they, they share data. And mixing, sharing, and mutation has a name. It's called data race. Okay? So what the objects in object-oriented programming are abstracting over is data races and you are not supposed to abstract over data races because then when you start combining these objects you get data races for free right <laughs> <laughs> and it turns out that for some reason we don't like data races okay the same thing is with you know so once you once you realize that you, you think okay now I know how to avoid data races right uh, I'm, go I'm going to use locks, and I'm going to hide locks too, because I want to abstract over it. So like in, in Java, like every object has its own lock, right? Um, and unfortunately, locks don't compose either, right? That's, that's the problem with locks. I'm not going to talk about this too much, because this is like a, a, that was a different course about um, concurrent programming. But I'm just mentioning it that uh, this, this kind of raising the levels of abstractions, uh, of abstraction, you have to be careful what you're abstracting over. What are the things that you are subtracting, throwing away, and not exposing, right? Functional programming, when you abstract things into functions, okay? And functions, and especially if you, in, in, in Haskell, when, uh, you know, in a functional language, you don't have mutation, so you don't have this problem with hiding um, data races. Um, and and then, then you also have ways of composing data structures into bigger data structures. And that's also because um, everything is immutable, so you can safely uh, compose and decompose things. Right? And now every time I, I, I learned a new language, um, I wanted like to find where the boundaries of this language are. What are like the, what are the hardest thing to do in this language, right? Uh, so, for instance, uh, in C plus plus, right? Uh, what are the like the highest levels of abstractions that you can get? Template metaprogramming, right? This, so this, I was really fascinated by template metaprogramming. And, uh, and I started reading these books about template metaprogramming, and it's like, wow, this, this is like, I would, have, I would never come up with, this, with these ideas. They are so complex, right? So um, what, what it turns out uh, that these are very simple ideas. It's just that the language is so awkward in expressing them. So, I, I learned a little bit of Haskell and I saw, okay, so this huge template that was so complicated, that's a one line of, of code in Haskell, right? 
okay, so there are languages in which that would like jump the level of abstraction and uh, make it much easier to program at a higher level of abstraction, right? <laughs> and in every language, you know, there is this group of people who are writing libraries, right? And they always stretch the language. They always go to the highest possible abstraction level, and they and and they hack, right? They hack at it as much as possible. So I thought. Okay, I, I, I don't like hacking. I just want to, to use a language that, that allows me um, to express myself at a high level of abstraction. And, and um, that lets me uh, express new ideas that are much more interesting. You know, like uh, with template metaprogramming, right, you express this idea that you might have lots of data structures that only differ by the type that they hide, right? Like you can have vector of integers and vector of booleans, right? And there's just so much code to share. So if you abstract over the data type that you are storing there, like if you forget about it, hide it, abstract over it, you can write code, an abstract code, and, and in C++ you do this with templates. Right? And, uh, and you get something, something new. You, you program at a higher level, right? A higher abstraction level, because you dis disregard some of the details. So that was, that was great. Now it turns out that, um, so once I learned Haskell, uh, I, I'm still learning Haskell, but you know, it's, to some extent, then I found out, okay, uh, there are things in Haskell that are at these boundaries of abstraction. That's like, um, there are people who are working on, on this uh, frontier of Haskell, right? There are certain very abstract things that are, unfortunately, they are a little bit awkward to express in Haskell, right? And then, there is this barrier to abstraction even in Haskell, right? And uh, I mean, I mean, if you've seen uh, some libraries that were written by Edward Kmet, um, you realize, you know, that th they are really extremely hard to understand. It's, it's really hard to understand what was the thought process, right? And the secret is very simple category theory, okay? Edward Kmet knows category theory. And he just takes the stuff from category theory, he reads these papers, mathematical <laughs> papers, and he just translates them into Haskell. And when you translate stuff from category theory to Haskell, uh, you lose a lot of abstraction. You make it more concrete, right? You um, you sort of Haskell has one category built in, and you are uh, restricting yourself to this particular category. And I mean, you, you can you can create other categories in Haskell. You can model them, right? But but that becomes awkward. It, that becomes sort of like template metaprogramming, you know, within Haskell. Not exactly the same mechanism, but but the the level of difficulty in expressing these ideas in Haskell is as big as um, template metaprogramming in C++. So, the category theory is this higher level language above Haskell, above functional pro programming, above ML, uh, Haskell, uh, Scala, and so on, C++, assembly, it's a higher level language, okay? It's not a practical language that we can like, you know, write code in, but it's a language. So just like, you know, people who uh, write these uh, horrible metaprogramming template libraries in C++, 
they can only do this because they learned a little bit of Haskell, right? And they know what if uh, you know what some constructs in Haskell are and how to do things that are you know how to how to implement uh, algorithms on immutable data structures, right? They know how to do this because they learned it from Haskell, and they just translated into this horrible uh, template programming language. Fine, right? And it works, and uh, people are using it. The same way, if, you, if you're a functional programmer, you know, you can take these ideas from category theory, these very, very abstract ideas, and translate it into, well, this kind of awkward language called Haskell, right? Now, you, from looking from, from categorical perspective, Haskell becomes this ugly language, just like looking from Haskell, C++ becomes this ugly language, right? But at least, you know, it's an executable language, it's a language in which we can write programs. Um, and of course, these ideas, when they percolate from category theory down to Haskell, they can also percolate then down to C++ and maybe even to assembly. PHP or whatever, you know, JavaScript, <laughs> if you want to, um, because they, these, are, these are very general ideas. So we want to get to this highest possible level of abstraction to help us express ideas that later can be translated into programs. So that's for me, is the main practical motivation real-life programming problem, okay? And I'm, I'm, I'm even going to use C++ instead of Haskell, right? Um, so the problem is this. We have a library of functions um, that we wrote one day, right? And, and one day uh, the, the manager says, okay, there is a new requirement that I didn't tell you before, okay? This requirement is that uh, it's like enforced on us by the IRS or s something that every function has to have an audit trail. Okay, they are auditing us. So every function, whatever function you call, it has to create a little log that says I was called. Maybe even like say what arguments and so on. Right? Okay. But just, just like this, to simplify stuff, um, the name of the function, let's say, or the action that it does, has to be appended to a log. Okay? So now go and rewrite our library so that every function leaves a trail. Okay? And the simplest solution that comes to mind to, for a, to, to an imperative programmer, right, is like, well, what's the simplest solution? The fast and dirty solution. Yeah? What? Have a global log. Yes, of course. Have a global log. Have a something that's a string, let's say, right? So, so there is this log, um, you know, so what would be standard string, right? String log, trace, or something like this, right? We initialize it to an empty string, right? And now, let's say we have, in our library, we have a function negate, uh, bool negate, which takes a bool x, right? And it was um, implemented as return not x. Okay? And now we are modifying it. Okay, so the modification, well, so just before we return x, return not x, right? We'll insert log plus equal, let's say, not. Okay? 
C++. So the manager says, do this for every function there, okay? Because this is the simplest solution. Now, what does he mean by simplest solution? <coughs> And we as functional programmers, we are, we are thinking, ah, something is wrong, right? Uh, but how do we explain what's wrong with this solution, right? Because it is simple, like the fewest lines of code that we have to add, the fewer, fewest modifications. But is simplicity really measured in the number of lines of code? If, that, if this were true, that you know, why why would we even bother using functions and data structures and stuff? We would just write one huge function with a bunch of go-tos, right? <laughs> that that's the simplest thing, right? Probably we would like, cut down on the lines of code by half or, or so, right? So complexity and simplicity are not simple things. They <laughs> we have to have simplicity is not easy. Yeah. It, exactly. Something can be simple but it doesn't even it's easy. Right. It's so not getting simplicity is not easy, right? So how do we explain to our manager let's 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 suppose hypothetically we have a smart manager who can understand our arguments, right? Lives in the opposite world now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so the argument here is this: um, that if we do this, then we introduce something that is not visible in the code directly, but it is something that increases the complexity of our code in a hidden way, because what it produces is dependence, right? So there's a hidden dependency between this thing and this thing that's sort of like a long distance interaction in quantum mechanics, right? Right? So, so there is this long distance interaction that, you know, when you look at negate, it takes a bull and returns a bull. There's no mention that it's writing to some global variable, right? And in fact, you know, if, if, if somebody removes this line of code, maybe it's some header file somewhere, you know, removes this line of code, then suddenly all your functions are broken, right? Even though you didn't do anything to them. So there is this long distance dependency that you have introduced. And if this doesn't convince your, your manager, well, then you do this. And then a few months later, your manager comes back and says, well, we have yet another requirement, you know. We have to uh, use our library in a um, multi-threaded environment, okay? So we'll be calling these functions from multiple threads. And now you say, ah, did I say so? Yeah. You know, right? <laughs> okay. So, of course, the next... Uh, logical step in simplifying your life is, well, let's have a global lock, right? <laughs> That's the simplest solution. Uh, right, and, and, and of course, you know, locks don't compose and, and uh, you get into possible deadlock situations and stuff like this, right? So the complexity increases even though we are, like, at every step picking the simplest possible path, seemingly, right? But we have to think about these hidden complexes. <coughs> so this, all this stuff does, would not happen uh, if we were programming in Haskell, because in Haskell you cannot have you know, stuff like this. All functions are supposed to be pure. And, um, and, and uh, you know, so like, can you, can you implement this using pure functions? Well, of course you can. Right? I mean, and this, the solution is very simple. Okay, I'm, I'm going to rewrite this here. Okay, what would we do? <coughs> well, so negate, it may, it may look more complex on first sight, okay? But don't get scared because it's really simpler. It's just that we are making things more explicit. So negate takes a bool 
x, right, and takes a string. Log, right? And now it says log plus equal not and return. Now what does it return, huh? Well, it has, if, if it does only this, then, you know, it has to return a string. It, it has to be a pure function, right? Well, if it's a pure function, then, yeah. Okay, let me, let me write it in, in a more, more pure, in, in a purer way, okay? So we'll say return make pair of not x and log plus <coughs> not. Okay? And now, of course, I, can, I have to say what it returns. It returns a pair Okay, will this work? If I put a parenthesis here. <laughs> <laughs> this will work, right? And this is a pure function. Yeah. So I don't even use plus equal, I'm just using plus. So I'm creating a new string, you know, it's like everything is pure, no side effects, nothing. And this will work. It's a little bit awkward though, okay? The, the awkwardness, well, there's one obvious awkwardness. It's like, okay, I said, how do you know that, that the function is pure? Uh, you know if you can memoize it, right? So for instance, the function negate is very easy to memoize, right? Because it, you, you just have to tabulate it. What's the value for true? Okay, it's false. What's the value for false? Okay, it's true. So it, it's, it's just, you know, two elements, and that's it. You have tabulated your function, so it's very easy to memoize. Now try to memoize this function. Now this is a function of two arguments, right? So it, as far as the x is concerned, that, that there are only these two possibilities. But then every time you call this function with a different initial string, you get a different result. So if you wanted to memoize it, you would have to memoize it for every possible history of calls. Okay, that's not very good, right? Um, but there is, there is also this um, more subtle problem with this. The subtle problem is this use of plus here, okay? It, does, it seems like a, it's, a, it's a tiny problem, but why is a function called negate, why does it know about appending strings, okay? So now every function in our library does stuff that's sort of local to it. So now we have this local and global, right? This, this was a very global solution, right? It broke the locality. This one is more local, but still, um, It has this element of knowing stuff that does not belong here. This function should know about negation, so it should know about this. And also this function should know about saying no. Okay? Why does it say French. French, I say, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, okay, so why does it know about appending strings, right? That's not like uh, in, in the you know, scope of what this function should know about, right? Violation of the principle of separation of concern. Yeah, yeah. It's via we are violating the principle of separation of concerns. It's not good. 
So, it's, so this is a good solution, but not quite. So what we really would like to do is for this function to just know that it has to return a pair. Well, it definitely has to negate this, it, this argument. It also has to say no in French, right? But it shouldn't take the log, okay? I'm just saying this is wrong to take the log and do the appending. Now, the concerns are separated, right? This thing doesn't do any stuff that it's not its con concern. That's only the local stuff, right? <clears throat> the problem is, though, who does the appending of these logs, right? The, 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 right? Who, who generates the big log? Right? This function does only its own thing, but somebody has to concatenate these logs. Right? So the answer to this is, what do we do with these functions? Right? What we do with these functions is we compose them, just like you know, in every programming problem. We decompose it into functions and then we recompose the result. So we have to be able to compose functions like <coughs> this. So what if we modify the process of composing functions? Right? We have already modified the functions, but now let's say we modify how we compose functions. So let's, let's define a new way of composing functions that will take care of composing functions that return these pairs, okay? So let's, let's define a function compose. And this will be stretching a little bit uh, the knowledge of C++, right? So, so this function compose, <coughs> it is supposed to take two functions, right? So let's, let's pass them as function objects in C++. So it has to compose functions that are composable. Okay? So it, it will uh, compose a function that, let's say, uh, returns and B and takes an A. Okay. I think that's the that's the syntax for type typing functions, right? So it's a function that takes an A and returns a B. Okay, so so this is some F. It takes another function. that takes a B and returns a C. Right. Probably in C++ you, I would use capital letters for that because template parameters. Who cares? So that's G. Okay. And it should return a third function that takes uh, takes an A and returns a C, right? So I want to define a function like this. So it's a higher order function, right? So this is something that's kind of new in, 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 C++, in, in C++ and Java, you know, having functions as arguments and returning functions and creating them on the spot. So how would we compose these two functions? Well, we'll have to call this function f, right? But where do we get the argument for it? Well, if it's returning a function, we have to like on the spot declare a function or 
construct a function inside of this. Let's call a lambda, right? And that's a new thing in, in Java and, and, and also pretty fresh thing in, um, in C++. Um, so how do we do this? Um, we say return. Uh, and then we have to like use the syntax that the capture list, like what do we have to capture? We have to capture F and then we <coughs> capture G, right? Um, and it takes uh, as an argument some <coughs> A, let's call it X, type A, right? So it takes this function, and here's the implementation of this function. Right, so it's creating a function that takes an x of type a, and what does it do? Well, it calls f with x, right? Because it makes sense, and it remembers its results. Let's let's call it auto p1 equals f of x, right? Now we have to call g. But what, what G is called with a type that's return, returned by this F, right? Oh, actually, okay, so I'm writing, right now I'm just writing regular co function composition, okay? So regular function composition would just take this P1. and would return this P2. <coughs> right? That's not exactly what we want to do, right? This is regular function composition. That's our starting point. Unfortunately, they don't even define this in the standard library, like a regular function composition in C++ is not even but what we want to do is we want to com uh, compose functions that return pairs, okay? So instead of having a function that returns a B, it returns, okay, now I don't know how where to write it. it. It returns a pair of B and string and takes an A. And this guy, also returns a pair of C and string and takes a B. Okay? So I'm replacing this stuff with these, I'll call them embellished functions, okay? Functions that return an embellished result. I started with functions that were just taking a boolean and returning a boolean. Now I want a function that takes a boolean and returns a boolean paired with a string, and so on. And I want to do this for any type, right? So if I have a function that takes an integer and returns a double, I want to change it to a function that, re that takes an integer and returns a double paired with a string, with the part of the log, right? <clears throat> so now P1, if I call f with x, P1 is a pair now, that's why I call it P, right? So if I want to call G, I have to do the first of this pair, okay? First part of this pair is an argument to the second function. Now what I should return now is make pair <clears throat> and the final result was is the first part of P2 right so P2 dot first So if this was a boolean or a double and so on, I'm just extracting the original value that was put in, that was returned by this function. But now it also returns a string. 
And this is where I'm concatenating the strings. So I take P2, P1 dot second. Is that called second in C++? Yes. Yeah? OK. Uh, plus P2 dot second. OK? So what I have done here is I defined a new way of composing these functions. And this composition takes care of appending strings. So string appending is done in compo in the com inside the composition. And it kind of, if you think about it, it makes much more sense because string appending means really that I'm combining results of two functions, right? So it is really part of composing. This is. This is my way of composing functions. Okay, I'm sorry this is so low on, the, on this <laughs> whiteboard. Um, and now every time, so if, if, if um, since this is a, a, a talk about category theory, right? So, uh, like if you hear the word composing, composition, right? You should immediately, like, hear, is there a category? Because category, remember, is about composition. Composition and identity, right? I have just defined a way of composing certain things. Do I have a category? So this composition of, of these special functions, this, this, these embellished functions, um, I bet it's associative, right? How do I know it's associative? Well, like, like if you look at the first parts, uh, first parts of the pairs, right? I'm just doing like a regular composition that, that I used before, right? And that one was associative. The question is, is the second part associated? And what's the second part? I'm concatenating strings. Okay. And fortunately, string concatenation is associative. Right? So if I take three such functions and, co and uh, compose them, the order in which I concatenate these logs doesn't matter. Right? Concatenation of logs is associative. So I have associativity because string concatenation is associative. Okay. Do I have identity? What would identity be for this kind of composition? Well, it would have to be a function that returns a pair of a string, right? It's called ID, and it takes an A. And if it's an identity, then it should do nothing, right? So how do you do nothing? Well, you just return make pair. You have to produce a pair, right? Because it returns a pair. So all our embellished functions are like this. So identity has to be embellished as well. So you make a pair. And the first part of this pair should be x without any change, right? I'm doing nothing. I'm just returning whatever you pass to me. But what's the second part of this pair? Empty string, right? It should not append anything to the log. It should do nothing to the log. And now if you remember, string concatenation 
that's an interesting one, right? If you concatenate two strings, you get a third string, right? It's a binary operator. Uh, does it have a unit? Yeah, empty string, right? You append an empty string or prepend an empty string. You don't change anything. It's associative, obviously. You know, it's like what do we what do we have here? We have a binary operator that's associative and has a unit, right? This thing will work for any monoid. Doesn't have to be strings. Any monoid I define is fine. So my logging actually can will work for any monoid. It's kind of hard to abstract it in C++, but in Haskell, actually, the definition of the stuff in includes a monoid. Because we want to impose as, as little, as few conditions as possible. And this, the, the, like, the, the only condition that we have to impose is that it's a monoid. If we want the composition to be, to form a category. So I have composition, I have identity, I have myself a category. I build a category. The objects in this, in this category are A, B, C, are types. But arrows in this category are not my regular functions. So if I have two objects, A and B, the arrow between A and B is not a function from A and B. It's a function from A to a pair, B and string. Now I switch to Haskell notation. An arrow between two objects A and B is a function that's embellished. And I know how to compose these functions, and I know what the identity is, and I have a category. Now this category, I haven't invented this category for this purpose, this category actually has a name, it's called a Kleisley category. Okay, so remember this, Kleisley, and these are called Kleisley arrows, these functions that, that are embellished. And Kleisley arrows can be defined for a lot of embellishments. I just gave you an example of one embellishment in which I'm like pairing my results with a string. But there are many other possible embellishments that are extremely useful. And in fact, this is a view of something that has been, that you've heard about before, called a monad. 